look, the truth is this, extremely fast picking speeds like 220, 240, 260 beats per minute, 16th notes, or even faster, are all achieved by using specific techniques that are capable of those kinds of speeds. If you're not using those techniques, then no amount of training will do anything. Large quantum differences in performance between you and other players don't happen because other players are more dedicated and train harder than you. And most of the time, they don't even happen because other players have ridiculously better genetics than you. They happen because other players are simply doing things differently. And one of those differences is the subject of this lesson. It's one of the most common fast picking techniques of all time, reverse dart thrower wrist motion. The sneaky thing about the wrist joint is that it can move along different axes. This is wrist motion, this is wrist motion, and this is wrist motion. And even though these motions have a different appearance on the surface, it's the same joint that's moving in each of these cases. It's just moving along a slightly different axis or direction. The wrist joint's 360 degree range of motion is complex enough that its capabilities and the reason they evolved to be that way are still being studied. One place where that kind of research happens is the Hospital for Special Surgery here in New York City. We visited them to discuss what researchers call the dart thrower's wrist motion. So dart thrower's motion is, it comes from the dart throwing activity because in order to throw a dart, what you do is you bring your wrist up into what we call extension, which is the up motion, and then a little bit of radial deviation, which is the movement towards the thumb. So you have that combined radial extension, and then to release the dart, you bring your wrist down into a combination of flexion and ulnar deviation, which is the down motion and the movement to the pinky side. When you throw a dart, most people don't perceive that as two movements combining. They just think they're moving their hand at the wrist, right, in the generic sense of the term. Correct. But what you're saying is there's actually two different movements combining Correct. to make this dart throwing movement Correct. Happen. And actually, I mean, all of our activities all activities that we do are combined movements. So we don't really do any movements in isolation. It's very rare that we'll use one absolute movement. The ability of the wrist to make a dart throwing motion is not only significant for performing a number of critical human activities, from pouring, to hammering, to throwing, and so on. But thanks to the wrist's multi-axis capability, the team determined that there are actually slightly different versions of this motion that you can make based on the type of activity you're performing. The resulting plot is a vivid depiction of the centrality of the dart thrower's motion to a wide variety of important everyday skills. There was just one problem. Lots of guitarists were doing something else. When we showed the team footage of our interviews with players like the incredible Albert Lee, they recognized right away that these were not, in fact, dart thrower motions. The arm position these players were using, in combination with the direction their wrists were moving, were almost the inverse of that. And this came as a surprise, since the ability to perform a dart throwing motion has been credited as a significant driver of the evolution of human hand and arm mechanics for things like tool use. To discover that there's a whole class of high performance human motions that go the other way was really interesting. To describe these guitar motions with their inverted arm positions and motion paths, Dr. Wolf used and possibly even coined the term reverse dart thrower motion. So we do see, for example, like reverse dart throwers. If you try to ulnarly extend, to go from ulnar extension into radial flexion. So for example, like if you're, I don't know, peeling or, you know, well, as a musician, you might appreciate this reed making, for example. So like they do a lot of that, which is reverse dart throwing. This whole dart throwing business is counterintuitive because we typically think of wrist motions as moving more this way, along an axis from the thumb to the pinky. We call this type of wrist motion deviation. But it turns out that the better performing wrist motions move a little differently. The dart thrower motion moves on a diagonal axis that goes a little bit up and to the left. And the reverse dart thrower motion moves along an inverted diagonal axis that goes a little bit up and to the right. And neither of these motions trace the thumb to pinky axis of deviation that most of us probably imagine when we think of picking technique. It gets even weirder when you look at the muscles involved. There are actually only five main ones, and you'll notice that their coverage is a little spotty. For example, there's no muscle that pulls straight up into wrist extension. And yet, most of us have no trouble at all moving our hands straight up. It turns out that the ability to point to the gaps 
is achieved through unusual combinations of the five muscles firing, often at the same time and often in opposite directions. It's super weird and complicated, but the system functions so seamlessly that we can't perceive these different firing combinations when we move. However, there is a clue. If we look at this set here, they roughly approximate the dart thrower axis of motion. And if we average this pair here, surprise, it's the reverse dart thrower axis. The fact that the dart axes are a good match for the direction that specific muscles are already pulling, this may be why we get better performance when we move in these two general directions. If that's true, then relentless training applied to a deviation style motion will not produce the same level of speed and effortlessness as either of the two dart throwing motions because the underlying mechanics are simply not capable of it. Since the meeting at HSS, we've continued our field work interviewing world-class players. And what we've learned is that most high-performance wrist motions used in guitar picking fall into one of these two categories. The dart thrower players, like Molly Tuttle in Bluegrass, and John Taylor in Metal, and the reverse dart players, like Eddie Van Halen, Albert Lee and Country, Yosho Stefan and Gypsy Jazz, and Andy Wood in Rock and Bluegrass. The whole concept behind reverse dart thrower picking is that it's easier to make this kind of motion than it is to make this kind of thumb to pinky motion. But of course, if you try to do the easy motion on a guitar, <laughs> you end up going almost straight down right into the body like you're knocking on a door, and that doesn't work very well. So instead, you just turn the arm a little bit this way, ta-da, and amazingly, now you can make the easy motion, except it goes sideways in a way which is much more useful for picking the string. When you do this, it turns out you're making the same type of wrist motion you would make when you use an ergonomic mouse like this one. The sneaky thing about this ergonomic mouse style motion is that when you observe it with a pick from a few feet away, you really can't tell that the arm is tilted. It just looks like the player's hand is going side to side from that thumb to the pinky type axis. And this is one of the reasons this technique has been kind of hiding in plain sight all this time. When you look at players like Al DiMiola and Andy Wood, it looks like they're doing the thumb to pinky motion. It's only when you look up close in magnet view that you can see that that's not really what's happening. In Andy's technique, we can see this part of his forearm here. That's how we know his arm is actually tilted, similar to the form you would use with an ergonomic mouse. But that's not the only thing that's tilted. Look at the path the pick is traveling. The pick is actually moving along a diagonal. So two things are diagonal here, the forearm position and the wrist motion itself. Nothing in this picture is actually moving side to side the way you think it is. To make this even clearer, let's rotate the camera so that Andy's forearm is exactly side to side. Now this is the real wrist motion Andy's making. And I think you can see very clearly, it's definitely not a sideways thumb to pinky type of motion at all, but in fact, an ergonomic mouse AKA reverse dart thrower wrist motion. You can even take this tilting of the arm idea one step further. If I turn the arm a little more, that allows me to make this type of wrist motion. And now that actually does start to look a little different. This motion is more similar to the type of motion that you'd make with a taller ergonomic mouse like this one. Notice how the hand is in more of a joystick style position. This motion is even more similar to that door knocking motion that we started out with. We're just doing it sideways with the arm on a tilt. Now the cracking the code theory on this is that the taller ergonomic mouse version of the motion is easier to do because it's closer to the true reverse dart thrower axis of the wrist. In other words, the wrist basically evolved to go diagonally with the least amount of muscle work. And as a result, the dart thrower motions should be faster with greater endurance 
because they require less of this extra muscle effort or stiffening. Well, that's our theory anyway. We'd have to measure this in a laboratory setting to know for sure. But I will say this, you will notice that in styles of music that depend on very fast playing, like metal, you will see lots more players who make motions that look like this. Ola England's technique has the tall ergonomic mouse look. And so do the guys from Archspire. The pioneering Chuck Schuldiner from Death. And of course, the legendary James Hetfield. Okay, awesome. How do I get this enhanced performance? It's actually pretty simple. Just change the pick grip. You will notice that almost all these players are using either a middle or three finger pick grip like this, or a trailing edge pick grip. Now it's not the pick grip by itself, it's the fact that using these grips lets you use the more rotated arm position and that lets you create this type of motion. Again, your taller ergonomic mouse kind of motion. In fact, the very first wrist motion I was able to do that got into death metal speeds was by experimenting with exactly this type of taller ergonomic mouse form. I was able to get this at 250 beats per minute. What resulted was an all upstrokes motion, like what Hetfield does, but in reverse. Then by trying to get the pick to come back through the string on the downstroke, I was able to convert that into alternate picking at the same speed. Players have wondered openly for years, how is James Hetfield able to do downstrokes at these ridiculous speeds? Is there some kind of trick to it? Yes, even though Hetfield's famous downstrokes technique isn't alternate picking, it still benefits from being performed more closely aligned with the reverse dart axis. This is the trick. If you compare my 250 BPM upstrokes to my 250 BPM alternate picking, you'll see it. The alternate picking motion moves in a straight line. The up picking motion moves along the same line. The only difference is that the up picking motion narrowly avoids the string on the way back during the downstroke. So technically it's tracing an oval path, but the oval is so narrow that it approximates the linear path of the alternate picking motion. And what is this path? It's the reverse dart thrower axis of wrist motion. That's why these motions are fast. In other words, at very fast speeds, alternate picking, down picking, and up picking are all essentially the same motion. Now when I do this, I'm not even thinking about the downstroke. In fact, the upstroke feels like the downstroke because of the way it mimics that door knocking motion that we started out with. So I just think about the upstroke or the trap stroke. I just let the hand take care of the downstroke in a way that feels kind of automatic. Now the riff examples I'm playing are all synchronized in that they are exact subdivisions of the beat at these different speeds, even when it's just a repeated bass note. But you can of course also use these techniques for coordinated single note lead playing. The process is no different and no more difficult than two-handed playing at any other fast speed. You just have to choose lines you can actually fret at these tempos. So how many 250 lines you got? I don't got a ton, but I got some.
So can you unlock very fast reverse dart thrower speeds by making the taller ergonomic mouse version of the motion? Yes. Do you need to have special genetics for speed? No, I don't think so. I was never able to play at these speeds until I figured this stuff out. So I think most people just never tried these techniques before and that's why they don't get these results. Now, that being said, a couple of points on how to do this. First, these very fast speeds all use this slightly more supinated arm position. We turn the arm a little further than the flatter ergonomic mouse position. So we're turning it a little bit beyond that. However, trying to rotate the arm past a certain point is no good. For example, if you do this, you'll feel a big stretch in this area right here and a strain on the other side because you're actually using your supinator muscles to keep the forearm in this somewhat extreme position. This is not necessary. Remember, it's not the arm position that makes this motion work. You can do the motion this way and you can feel how easy this is. So it's already efficient, it's just not that great for picking in this position because it's coming down vertically. So the only reason you're rotating the arm is just to get the motion to come in more sideways so you can pick the string. Well, how do you know how far to turn the arm? Simple, don't think about that. Just think about the pick grip and let the arm be wherever it wants to be where the grip feels smooth. You don't want any muscular force in the arm to maintain this position, it should just feel comfortable. Turning the arm past that point doesn't make the wrist motion any better, it just tilts the motion more. And of course, once you go past about, I would say here, you're just stressing the forearm muscles in a way that's not necessary. Now, if you're a regular Cracking the Code viewer, you will notice that the motions we're looking at here have another special quality to them. Escape. The picking path moves along a diagonal where downstrokes go up in the air and upstrokes move toward the guitar body and get trapped. In Cracking the Code escape motion terminology, we call this a downstroke escape or DSX motion. Escape motion is what permits clean string switching at very fast speeds, and you can learn more about it in the other lessons on our channel and in the more comprehensive instructional material on our site. But the key thing to understand here is that this is something of a coincidence. The escape doesn't cause the speed. These motions are fast because they follow the reverse dart thrower axis of the wrist. The fact that they go up in the air is due to the arm position. So these two things are not really connected. In fact, we already saw this. You can do the motion like this, in the air and it's still fast. It's just not that useful for picking because it's coming down too vertical. So on the actual instrument, your choices are somewhat constrained by mechanics. Trying to flatten out the motion in this direction by rotating the arm even further isn't really possible because of that forearm strain that we talked about. And rotating it the other way makes it, again, too vertical to be usable. So for somewhat arbitrary physiological reasons, this is the sweet spot. It's the arm position where the reverse dart motion goes sideways enough to be usable on the string, and the arm position itself is still comfortable. This means that the very fastest reverse dart thrower picking motions that you can make all tend to be DSX motions, where downstrokes escape. This is true even for down picking and up picking because those motions all look like alternate picking at very high speed. There's another tip I wanna give you about performance which relates to something you may have already noticed in these slow motion clips, and it's this. Look at the size of that motion. Conventional guitar wisdom has placed so much emphasis on trying to make small motions as a way of getting faster that it may come as a surprise to you that a picking motion can look this absolutely huge at a speed as fast as 270 beats per minute 16th notes. But with reverse dart motion, this is actually pretty common. Yosho Stefan's awesome reverse dart strumming technique achieves very fast speeds over four and five string distances while putting out tons of acoustic volume. Because his motion is efficient, Yosho can fire it up for long, dramatic buildups in his live performances. Another total powerhouse strummer was the incredible Roy Clark. 
Roy's signature tune, Malagueña, was a tour de force of reverse darts drumming ability, routinely reaching speeds up to 175 beats per minute sextuplets, which is 260 sixteenth notes. This is faster than most players go, even on a single string. When a technique is efficient, you can not only go faster for longer, but you can do it even while applying more force than you might think would be possible, either to cover large distances for techniques like strumming, or to play louder for dynamics and excitement when you want it. So I wouldn't worry too much about the size of the motion that's being created. Trying to micromanage that is not a good way to learn the technique. Instead, what you want to focus on, first and foremost, is generating a motion that goes very fast right from the start, almost like playing a button mashing video game. And two, you want that motion to feel easier than you expect without having to push through burning muscle fatigue. And that was easy. This is all coordination. The ones where you get it are the ones where it feels easy. The other ones are like, ah, something's just fighting you. But when everybody quiets down and you just do the thing, it's, it's like, oh, there it is. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, nothing. This type of sudden increase in efficiency can almost make breakthroughs feel like happy accidents, more so than hard-won victories. But that's actually how motor learning works. And this may take some trial and error, but if you can experience speeds over 200 beats per minute 16th notes and a feeling of ease and smoothness, you're on the right track. Because of the non-obviousness of all of this, it took us years of interviews, experimentation, and testing with students to develop and refine the relatively simple advice that we're presenting in this lesson. And we're grateful for everyone who spared their time to sit down with us. If you want to go further, you can actually get personalized feedback on your playing directly from me and the instructor team at Cracking the Code. After you complete your initial diagnostic tests, you can upload clips of your own playing for feedback from us. Cracking the Code is unique with our specific focus on picking technique. Nobody else has done the massive amount of specialized work on this subject that we have, interviewing the world's best players and researchers, pioneering the use of slow motion analysis for instrument technique, and even designing our own hardware to make these investigations possible. If you want to get started solving your most challenging picking technique problems, we're thrilled to help. And I know that sounds a little weird, but I mean that. We take the hard cases. Our core focus is figuring out evidence-based methods for taking your true performance capability and translating it to the instrument. And we're constantly developing new and better tricks for doing this. If that sounds like something you're looking for, then head on over to TroyGrady.com and check us out.